Uh, hello, I'm Charles Clover. I'm executive director of Blue Marine Foundation and one of the co-chairs co of the judges uh, on this these Ocean Awards. And I'm very pleased to introduce uh, Dr. Lauren Beerman from uh, Plymouth Marine Laboratory, who is, uh, is a winner of one of our science awards. And uh, she has done some quite extraordinary work uh, spotting plastic litter from space. Hi Charles, thank you so much. So yes, I'm Lauren and I work at Plymouth Marine Laboratory in the UK, um, but I also get to work with amazing colleagues there and collaborators all across the world at the moment with the singular focus of trying to look for marine plastics. And what I've been doing for about the last two years with my colleagues at PML is we've been looking at the use of satellites to detect aggregations of plastics in the marine environment. And what we have found is that using free data collected by this amazing satellite, it's a European Space Agency satellite called Sentinel-2, is we are actually able to detect patches of floating plastics in the marine environment. And using that information as a bit of a springboard, we have been able to support things ongoing all over the world. So I'm really lucky to be able to work with uh, groups in the States who've been looking at the Great Pacific Garbage Patch and groups uh, like the Mindaroo Foundation who've been making their own springboards using Bali as an example in order to have um, global studies as well. And I think what I really like about the work that we've done over the last two years is how it's providing this incredible springboard into an understanding of plastics as this, in the marine environment as a really global issue. Now, I'm just one of a judging panel, but they all thought that what you were doing was quite fantastic and have given you uh, the Science Award as a result. Um, but perhaps you could take us back to where you started. How did you, how, how did that first moment uh, where you realized that you were onto something happen? Yeah, it's, it's quite a funny story. I think uh, there's a cartoon about it where everyone thinks science happens as a eureka, but sometimes science happens as a hmm, this is strange. And that was very much the process for me. I was looking for patches of seaweed in Scotland and I saw a patch of floating stuff and I thought, hmm, this is strange. It doesn't look like seaweed. What could it be? And I think I, uh, I'm just really curious about these things. And so I wanted to find out what it was. And I made a list of all of the things that floated in the marine environment. I was like, Maybe it's sea foam, uh, maybe it's driftwood. So I went and found what driftwood and, and sea foam look like to satellites. And uh, at one stage, I was convinced they were birds. I was like, maybe it's just huge amounts of birds that have aggregated along this front. And I went out and tried to find all my bird friends to find out at what time of year we could expect those birds in Scotland. And it was too early. Um, and uh, then thanks to some amazing work done uh, by the University of the Aegean's Marine Remote Sensing Group, they put out plastic targets in Greece. And I looked at those targets and that was it. I knew straight away that I'd seen plastics. And this was in a remote place off Scotland where you weren't yeah. expecting it. Exactly. So it's near the Isle of May, which is off the east coast of Scotland. Uh, and I don't know if you've ever had the privilege of being of going to the Isle of May it's absolutely stunning it's just chocked chock full of sort of amazing birds and wildlife and um you just watch the sort of front of kind of impending plastics and um yeah it's it's not a nice thing to see but it's really interesting in the North Sea that plastic could have traveled all of the way from the Elbe River in Germany um and so the the circulation it's not it's it's not just that maybe scottish people are litterbugs and that plastic came from scotland it could have come from anywhere and that's quite frightening it certainly is the the juxtaposition of of these incredibly what we think of as pristine places with all that plastic which may not even be a local phenomenon um and i think is what worries all of us about it. But you got into this um, that way, and then you started um, a, a trying to uh, study, schematize where it was all coming from and where it went. And I find that quite fascinating. Where did you look next in terms of the oceans? 
Yeah, so I definitely uh, sort of stood on the shoulders of people who'd already done so much excellent work in, in that sort of field. So I went to the literature. It's the first thing I did was like, oh, I, I think I've spotted something interesting. Uh, let me go see what other scientists have found. And I think that that was the first time where I went, whoa, there's nothing published on this. Um, how can that be? Um, but then I started to look at where people had found plastics in very big aggregations in their own waters doing really, you know, tricky field work, being very conscientious and collecting large amounts of data. And so I went to the areas where they had found plastic systematically and thought, can I also spot that from satellite? Um, and some of the time I could. So the, the example of that is just of British Columbia and um, where um, there'd been a lot of field work done in that area and off uh, the south of Gabriola Island, um, I found recurring there's a really um strong circulation feature there that sort of catches the debris and um and pa and, make, and turns it into patches and that's where i was able to spot what i think is probably a combination of driftwood and polystyrene and you know once you start to know where to look almost every time there's something to detect um and you know this was true off waters in uh british columbia so, you know, I think I, um, I even fell into a bit of a, a hole that I think a lot of readers or, or members of the public fall into as well, which is plastic pollution is more of a developing world problem. But I have found that to, to be not true at all. You know, I've detected plastics of Italy, British Columbia, Scotland, you know, developed countries, first world countries with this perception of being uh, world leading. Um, the, the German bite outside the Elbe River, it's just really unexpected. So it's definitely, I think if, if my paper showed anything, it's that this really is this global issue and there is no country that is off the hook. Is there more plastic in, in some oceans than others and off uh, some countries rather than others? Or is it a universal problem? I mean, I think I have um, definitely seen greater chances of detecting debris, plastic debris mixed with other materials um, in certain countries than, than others. Um, and it depends, is there a marina nearby? Uh, is it polystyrene based plastic that I'm seeing because that's very easy to detect? Um, but yes, I think, you know, the global trade of plastic starts to play a role here where we know that Europe and North America, for example, um, transport a lot of their plastic waste to Southeast Asia and China. And uh, how do they deal with those plastics, right? So you have illegal landfills or you have incineration and a proportion of those plastics from America, but now in Southeast Asia, have a greater likelihood of then entering the ocean. So it's this really complicated problem. And this all started with me going, hmm, that doesn't look like seaweed. And suddenly just, you know, realizing that there's the fossil fuel industry, the petrochemical industry, global trade patterns of plastic. And where do you start to untangle this problem and how do you get involved and make it better? So the, the, the problem of plastic, um, how big is it and does it matter? Oh, I think it absolutely does. Uh, and I think the problem is so pervasive as well. It's huge and it has its roots in the fossil fuel industry, right? So the raw materials of plastics are oil, gas, and coal. And you're dealing with a similar family uh, of problems as you are with climate change. Um, and I know that there are scientists out there uh, who believe or um, perhaps think that plastic pollution is a dangerous distraction from other pressures on the ocean, like overfishing. Um, and in a way, I agree. I think overfishing, for example, and climate change and ocean warming, I think these are absolutely paramount, uh, are of paramount importance. But if we remove one pressure on the ocean, then we're doing a lot of good as it is. Um, and the flip side of that is that people feel empowered when it comes to plastics. It's not just about straws. It's also about advocacy and um, pushing forward legislation. And so, you know, um, if we can get people more ocean literate through their sort of passion about plastics, then I think we're doing a lot of good on the whole. And is plastic that dangerous? Or is it toxic or, or is it it's destructive? Which is the, what is the worst aspect about it? I mean, I would say both. Uh, obviously, we've all seen pictures. I, you know, I don't even need to share it with you. You've got it in your mind. Entanglements. 
of these beautiful marine mammals that are quite charismatic. I, you know, they pull at the heartstrings, but they've, they've drowned, they've become entangled, they've died these long, drawn out, awful deaths. I mean, I feel like I, everyone can sort of feel, no, nobody wants that, right? So entanglement is a very visual impact of plastic. Um, the birds um, with their, you know, their babies' stomachs full of plastic, you know, we can all feel that really viscerally. And, and it's a very, again, a very visual impact of plastic. But um, my colleagues at Plymouth Marine Laboratory have also been showing toxicity of plastic and, and how it enters the marine food web as microplastics and the impact that that can have on fish health. Like we're, we're, we're starting at the very bottom of the marine food web really and how it moves in. But I mean, microplastics have been shown to be ubiquitous across the planet now. They're inside of us, they're inside of the things that we eat, uh, they're inside of our salt. Um, it's almost impossible to escape plastics now. And we do know there's mounting evidence about plastics to toxicity and the impact that it has on um, hormones and growth development. And whew, you know, we, we, need to, we need to turn off that tap. And how, uh, how much of this plastic comes from different things? I mean, how big, for example, can you see a, a piece from a satellite? How, it's, not, it's not the nodules that you're seeing, is it? Yeah, um, that's right. So we, and, we can't you know, up to the see... up to the fishing nets. You know, what, what's the biggest thing? What's the smallest thing you can you've seen? I mean, the bigger the better. You know, if something's big, we can see it. Uh, then, if plastics are small, so an individual water bottle, um, even if it's bright, we can't spot it until it's been grouped together with other things. So a lot of the time, we'll find that seaweed is a very good indicator of debris because. It forms clumps and then it catches the plastic um, and it will, it, you know, sort of aggregate along a river plume or in an eddy or a front. And then if we can spot, it's really easy to spot the seaweed. And then when we start to sort of dive in, we go, that pixel doesn't look like seaweed. It's dominated by plastics. So as long as a pixel is, so the Sentinel data that I use, it's free data. So I get that data for free. Anyone can access that data, which is amazing. So anyone can go and do this work that I do with the free data. Uh, so Sentinel-2 is a European Space Agency satellite and the pixel footprint is 10 by 10 meters. So if you kind of look around your room, 10 by 10 meters is quite big. Um, and in order to see the plastic in there, it needs to fill about 30 to 50% of that pixel. So that is about the size of this room. But actually in the ocean, um, because of other natural things floating with it, like seaweed or driftwood or even sea foam, it then becomes much easier to spot. And then we can tell which material is dominating in that pixel. It's very much a needle in a haystack exercise. Um, you're looking for, for absolutely small uh, pinpricks or, or points along a, a front or, you know, you've got thousands of pixels in a, in a scene and you're looking for a handful. Um, but I'm okay with that. I definitely don't ever want to reach a stage where it's really easy for me to see plastic because there's so much of it. Plastic is 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 a problem of of ocean circulations. It's it's I believe it's it's the ocean uh, uh, going round around the world and depositing the plastic in particular places. So you went off to dis to study some of those places. Um, what what did you conclude? I mean. I think we already know that a small proportion of plastics that enter the open ocean stay on the surface. Um, and it doesn't matter how well or how high the resolution is of the satellite that you're using, you're never gonna be able to detect something as small as just a plastic bottle. And so in fact, the circulation becomes absolutely paramount because it needs to gather those plastics into patches. So we're actually really reliant on submesoscale features like eddies on river fronts, and of course, the satellite that I'm using only collects data in coastal zones. And that's where a lot of this activity is happening. But what's been amazing is over the last year, I've, been, I've joined a working group called Giant Ocean, where um, the University of Hawaii, we, um, people from the University of Hawaii and NOAA and um, even Adidas, we work together and the International Space Station, and we work together to try and solve um, or to try and help the uh, collection or removal of ghost nets and derelict fishing gear in the Great Pacific Garbage Patch. 
So, you know, foundation work done in the coastal zone, relying on these sub mesoscale features has led to us being able to leverage other satellites in the Great Pacific Garbage Patch to try and support cleanup operations happening there. And that's what I really like about this work is um, I think I set a springboard and other people have been progressing it in the most creative and enormously important ways. And I'm so lucky to still be part of that. So I'm working with the Mindaroo Foundation who are looking at, at leveraging the work that I did at detecting illegal dump sites in Bali and eventually globally, and also the impact that has on plastics entering the coastal zone, you know, that leakage of plastics into the ocean. Um, and Giant Ocean working with NOAA and now being able to support uh, Ocean Voyages Institute in the Great Pacific Garbage Patch. So that paper was a springboard and people have been incredible at taking that work further. It's one of the things that everybody has heard of, the Great Pacific Garbage Patch. Is it actually a patch? How big is the plastic in it? Um, so uh, Eric van Zabel, he gave a really lovely talk uh, recently and he said it's not really even appropriate to think of it as, as a plastic soup. It's not like an island you can plant a flag in. It's more of a bouillon. So it's a broth. It's, it's got pieces of plastic floating in it, but it's not really densely packed in the way that you would find it in the coastal zone or along beach fronts. Um, but it's, and it's all down the water column, so it's not always on the surface either. And we found that as well with the ghost nets um, is that they're a bit like icebergs. The bulk sits beneath the surface of the water. We're looking for surface signatures that we can detect from satellites. And it's quite tricky. But having said that, when ocean voyagers do go out and they find these uh, sort of areas where the circulation has gathered the plastic into diffuse but big patches, they can often remove tons at a time in, in, a, in quite a small area. So that's what we're trying to help and support with the satellite data is going, if you just go a little bit west, you're going to find that patch and you're going to be able to remove loads in a go. And that's what we're trying to do. So that's the sweet spot of this research is what you can do about it is where is, is to take out the concentrations. Is that right? Abs I mean, absolutely. What I published, uh, what my colleagues and I published, so Dan Cleely, Victor Martinez, Vicente, um, and Costas, who, who was the one who put the targets out uh, at the University of Eugene. And um, what we've done is we've published a relatively dry technical paper. So the paper itself is not the exciting part. It's just that it provides the tools for everyone else to go and do this kind of work. Uh, and that's what we wanted to do is we wanted to say, look, here is everything we can possibly share. Go out with your drones, different types of satellites. Let us, you know, let us give you the, the starting point for, for you to do this work on your own. And the best bit is that um, I've been included in all of that work. People have been amazing and said, you know, come along on this journey to the Great Pacific Garbage Patch or to Bali. Um, let's get you involved. And it's been an amazing year for me. And the fishing industry, they play a part in this. I, I, I've read 40%, up to 40% in some obviously different in different places. But what, what, what can they do about it? I, I went to a really interesting talk recently, which was um, plastics in the Arctic. And they were talking about, you know, um, artisanal fisheries um, that have had been pressured, you know, 10 years ago, 20 years ago, to stop using material nets that they could uh, repair and they had ownership over uh, to move to plastic nets. Um, and I think, you know, plastic was, was only, has only been around since the late 1950s, right? It, it's, it's a relatively new thing in our life. Um, and because of its longevity, because of its uh, sort of strength, it's become so pervasive very quickly and it's not disappearing. But I think um, perhaps there is a way to move back to more traditional means of fishing. I mean, I, um, again, you know, in the Great Pacific Garbage Patch, the thing that Ocean Voyages Institute is removing is derelict fishing gear. And they're removing, like Charles, I'm not exaggerating, tons and, and like hundreds of tons of this stuff. I think Mary Crowley, who, um, who is um, the leader and the, the owner of Ocean Voyages Institute, who gets the, the vessels out there, who finds the money to, to fund the, the vessels out there, she's committed to removing a million pounds of plastic this year. And I think she's easily going to achieve that. Um, and that is just derelict fishing gear. She's looking for nets using um, different strategies, but if we can map those nets and tell her where they are, we can make the operation so much more efficient. 
um, giving her more time while she's out there to collect even more of these derelict uh, fishing nets. This is the fascinating thing. What you discovered was was in coastal waters, and you discovered that the, the satellites you were actually using to find what you found weren't monitoring the big open ocean, which is where these gyres, these great garbage patches actually are. Absolutely. Um, how did you get around that? Well, so the thing is, the European Space Agency's Sentinel-2 satellite is primarily a terrestrial satellite. That's why it offers such high spatial and spectral resolution. Um, but once we started working with NOAA in the Great Pacific Garbage Patch, we were using different satellites and they're very good. But of course, the method that we developed for plastic detection is quite well tuned to Sentinel-2 because of its unique combination of bands. So we've been very lucky in that we've been able to speak with ESA, the European Space Agency, and petition to have, for the first time, extended Sentinel-2 coverage over the Great Pacific Garbage Patch, potentially even this year, and I think our chances are looking really good, so that they can support Mary's operation looking for these plastic nets. So what are the next steps on dealing with ocean plastics? Well, we're continuing what we're doing with the with Mindaru and with the working groups in the Great Pacific Garbage Patch. Um, I would love to continue to speak and to try and raise awareness um, as much as possible through the scientific community, maybe tackle a little bit of that misconception about plastic being a distraction from bigger issues. Um, sort of remind people that, you know, removal of any ocean pressure is only can only be a good thing. Um, and to advocate as well as much as possible to, to say, you know, the legislation that's coming in um, looks really promising, you know, 40% of plastic that is discarded is single use. We don't need single use plastics, 40% of the pollution that we're dealing with is stuff that we can just, we just don't need to use it. And I realize that's a challenge for the industry, but as I said, plastic's only been around since the 1950s. I feel like the natural capital within human beings, with our beautiful brains, we can come up with something amazing that isn't plastic to deal with the single use issue. Um, and I would really like to see, I think that's low hanging fruit. I think that's something that we can do. Um, and I'd like, to, I'd like to just see a bit more legislation tackling this issue because I don't like seeing pressure on the consumer you know, my partner and I were really conscious about the plastics that we bring into our home and we do our best to minimize it. But we still, at the end of every month, have this big bin of plastics that we know are not going to be recycled. And what do you do with that? Even when you're trying, you end up bringing so many plastics home. And so it's a lot of pressure on the consumer where sometimes we're, we're in an environment where we have no choice or we have very little choice. So I think this is a legislation issue and I'd really love to support any efforts that are taking this to to the next step. I was going to ask you what you'll do yourself, but you've you've pretty much answered it. I mean, yeah, I mean, I, I've got the, you know, the plastic, I mean, the plastic free hair bars and conditioner bars, and we're doing everything in our power to, to get local veg boxes that don't have any plastic at all. And, but there's only so much you can do. I mean, my computer's plastic and I understand that plastic plays a very important role in our lives um you know half of my car is plastic and but it's um it's about it's about the stuff that we can change and i think you know the single use stuff is to me it's a no-brainer i feel like we can do that do you feel that government is doing enough about getting rid of these single use plastics as, as at the moment you know i have admiration for the people who work for example within defra and have passed uh, laws already that have made big differences. So um, no microplastics in cosmetics, for example, that, that was a huge step. And I was working for um, CFAS, so the um, marine agency uh, within DEFRA at the time. And it was just, it was really wonderful to see that being pushed through and the amount of effort that it took and sort of personal effort that that took within DEFRA. Um, I, think, I think DEFRA is always trying to do the best that they can do. And that's the question. What could we do about it? Whew. I mean, I feel like my line of work at the moment is prevention rather than cure. And um, I would like to be more involved on the cure part. And that's why I love working with the Mindaroo Foundation, because what they're seeking to achieve at the moment through their Global Plastics Watch is actually tracing from a, a plastic bottle on a beach in Thailand to the Fortune 500 company that invested in that plastic being produced. 
So we're talking about global trade on a whole new level. And I think this will be revolutionary because you can feel very powerless when you look at plastic bottles on a beach and you know that you're going to clean it up and you're going to come back tomorrow and there's going to be more. But in order to affect change, you have to go to the places where our money sits. And these are the companies on Wall Street where we, where we have our money and where we have a voice to go, we want you to divest from plastics. In the same way that we've been pressuring companies to divest from fossil fuels, it's the same family of problems again. Um, and I'm really, really happy to be working with something that doesn't just, it's not just the cleanup, which is important, of course, because that's a legacy issue that we need to address. But it's also about addressing it and saying we can do something more or we can do more and we can try and fix this at the source. And the source is in Wall Street. Thank you. I think we've got more than enough and it's absolutely fascinating. And um, I think we'll make a podcast of this. What do you oh, think, yeah. Sam? Yeah, that would be awesome. <laughs>